International Silver Company presents The Silver Theater. Starring Robert Montgomery in The Villain Still Pursues Her. Directed by Conrad Nagel. Brought to you on behalf of two of the greatest names in silverware. International Sterling, world-famous solid silver, and 1847 Rogers Brothers, America's finest silver plate. Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. This is Conrad Nagel greeting you from the stage of the Silver Theater in Hollywood and bringing you the 30th in our new series of dramatic productions. Next week, our stars will be Melvin Douglas and Constance Bennett. And among the other brilliant personalities whose names grace our guest book for future dates are Joan Crawford, Douglas Fairbanks Jr., and Helen Hayes. Last week, Robert Montgomery gave us a noteworthy dramatic performance as Gerald Conway in the psychological drama Expert Opinion. And today, Bob is with us again. This time, with as much of a contrast to last week's show as anyone could possibly conceive. For we're going to bring you an old-style 10, 20, 30 melodrama complete with trimmings, heart-rending musical backgrounds, asides whispered over the footlights for the special benefit of the audience, hisses for the villain, and applause for noble sentiments. It's all in fun, ladies and gentlemen, and I sincerely hope that you'll enjoy it. And now, for tonight only, our silver theater is transformed to a playhouse of almost a century ago. Those eminent romantic thespians, Montgomery and Wood, direct from New York City by way of Hoboken, Kalamazoo, and Keokuk, are appearing in True Boardman's heart-stirring drama, The Villain Still Pursues Her. In the orchestra pit, Professor Felix Mills raises his baton, and now at last, the gaslight's dim and the roller curtain is about to rise on Act One. The time, a day in early spring, late in the 1840s. The scene in New England farmhouse. Arabella Beaumont, played by Helen Wood, is seated before the fire, crocheting an atomacassar. Her father, the hardy gentleman farmer, Benjamin Beaumont, is at a desk going over his accounts. Our hero, honest Jack Bloodgood, played by Robert Montgomery, is not yet on the stage. But we shall know when he makes his entrance by the reception he receives from the admiring audience. But now, on with the drama. Curtain. Arabella, my child. Yes, father? I notice you're dressed in your best gown this evening. You expect a visitor, perhaps? I know full well that she expects Jack Bloodgood, but being modest, she'll deny it. I, father? And who would be visiting this house unless perhaps to see you? Arabella, did you hear someone at the door? At the door? Oh, I thought that sound was but a shutter striking against the window. Why do I lie? I know it is he. He's still my fluttering heart. Shall I go to the door, father dear? Unless you want to leave Jack standing on the porch, you'd better. Why, Jack Bloodgood, what a surprise. Good evening. <laughs> Good evening, Miss Beaumont. I was just driving by this evening and said to myself, Jack Bloodgood, inasmuch as you are in the vicinity, why not tarry for a brief but pleasant and instructive visit with Farmer Beaumont? Well, I'm glad you did. Our farm is ten miles out of his way, yet he was just driving by. Well, the first barricade, love will make him an otherwise honest man. Won't you sit down, Jack? Thank you, sir. Uh, would you care for a pipe of tobacco, son? Thank you. No, sir. A glass of elderberry wine, perhaps? I appreciate your hospitality, Farmer Beaumont, but I neither smoke nor drink. Oh, thank heavens. For lips that have touched liquor shall never touch mine. You are wise, my lad. It is lovely weather this evening, is it not, Miss Beaumont? It is indeed, Mr. Bloodgood. I must see to some chores out in the barn. I trust you'll both excuse me for a bit. As a matter of fact, I finished the chores hours ago, but then I was young once myself. <laughs> <laughs> well, I won't be long. Ah, alone at last. Would you care to hear me play the parlor organ, Mr. Bloodgood? I can think of nothing that would give me greater happiness. Very well, I shall. If you will but sing as I am playing. It would be, my dear Miss Beaumont, a privilege. <laughs> she is more to be pitied than censored. <laughs> she is more to be helped than despised. She is only a lassie who ventured on life's stormy paths ill-advised. <laughs> Do not scorn her with words harsh and bitter. Do not laugh at her shame and downfall. 
for a moment just stop and consider that a man was the cause of it all. <laughs> never have I heard such playing, Miss Beaumont. And never have I heard such singing, Mr. Bloodgood. <laughs> <laughs> Arabella, I... Oh, Mr. Plunkett, you must not hold my hand. Arabella, if I may call you Arabella. Ah, yes. Oh, my heart, I shall die of happiness. Yes, I should be honored to have you so address me, Mr. Bloodgood. And you must call me Jack. It is brazen of me, but it shall be as you wish. Ah, Jack. Arabella, at last, if you but knew how I have waited for this moment. Arabella, it has long been my intention to express to you a sentiment that I have cherished in my heart. For while I am but a poor but honest clerk in the banking establishment of Squire Doolittle, I swear to you from the first moment I laid eyes on you, singing like an angel in the choir of the First Methodist Episcopal Church at the northwest corner of Main Street and Walnut Avenue, I have loved you with all my heart. Will you say that you love me too and be my own sweet bride? Oh, this, this is so sudden. Why must they always say that? I am waiting, my beloved. What is your answer? Oh, yes. Yes, Jack, I do love you. And if Father gives his permission, I shall be your bride. Arabella, then I may kiss you. What a time for asking questions. Yes, Jack, <laughs> my own husband to be. Oh, Squire Doodle. Oh. So, I find my chief clerk, the penniless lad I protected and gave a trusted position in the bank even after its ownership passed from his father's hands into mine, embracing the young woman who is to be my wife. Your wife? Indeed, sir, Miss Beaumont has but this moment promised to be my wife. So, and what does her father say? Ah, but here he is. We'll ask him. Good evening, squire. Good evening, neighbor. I just came on a social call to remind you of the little matter of a loan upon your farm here. It falls due at noon tomorrow. I know, Squire, and it shall be paid. Even now, my son Thomas is on his way home from the grain dealer with the money for my entire crop. It will leave me short of funds, but I can meet the note in full. Ah, good. Uh, I mean not to press you, neighbor Beaumont, but the bank is badly in need of funds. He's right there, and I know why. Of course, uh, <laughs> there is one circumstance under which I might extend or even forget the loan. Uh, what do you mean, Squire Doolittle? Only this. That in lieu of payment, I might accept your daughter's hand in marriage. Oh, surely you're joking, Squire. I am not a joking man, my dear. <laughs> well, I shall be going. So, you say your son Thomas is on his way home with that money. How interesting. Good night, Miss Arabella. I kiss your hand. Oh, he must not know how I writhe beneath his very touch. Good night, Squire. Good night to you all, and pleasant dreams. Oh, Father, your blessing, tell us that we have it fully. I do not know, my daughter. We cannot anger the squire, at least not until the debt is paid. Oh, why does Thomas not return? I wondered that, too. Jack Bloodgood, your hand and brain are needed here. Mr. Beaumont, with your permission, I shall say farewell. There is business which requires my presence. Business, Jack? At such an hour? No hour too late for a noble deed, beloved. I learned that at my mother's knee. <laughs> Good night, Arabella, my one true love. Ah, oh, I fear to let him go. Something tells me he may near return to me. Must you go, beloved? I must. It is my duty call. Then go, and with my blessing. Farewell. 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 <laughs> ah, Ezra Sly and Amos Cadwaller. You are here, my friends, and young Tom Beaumont? He's in the back room, Squire. We've been doing just what you said, sir. Getting him drunk and belligerent. Excellent. He has the money with him. I found that out. Now get back to him. Jack Bloodgood will be here in search of him. <laughs> you remember the parts you are to play? Ezra, you get Beaumont to strike you. I shall shoot out the light. Yes, and I'm going to be the doctor. Yep, we know, Squire. Good. Now go. This will take care of young Bloodgood. Win Arabella and get the Beaumont farm for me all in one fell stroke. <laughs>
Good evening, Squire Doolittle. We meet again. Jack Bloodgood, a surprise to see you here. I come in search of young Tom Beaumont. Do you know... Uh, this way. Well, here he is now. How fortunate. Uh, good evening, Tom. Leave go of me. Why are you making these men leave go of me? Why, of course, son. Who are you, gentlemen, and why are you annoying this lad? He's a crook. That's why. A crook? Who says I'm a crook? I don't like the looks of this. I must get Tom out and quickly. Come, Tom, your father. Don't let me alone. He says I'm a crook. Just say that again and see what happens. Tom, you can't fight here. Please. Who says I can? Just say that again. You are a crook. A low, sneaving, thieving, double-dealing crook. That's all I needed. I... The light, the light. Somebody shout out the light. Bring a lantern. Here, what's wrong in here? Ezra. The boy here struck him and he hit his head against the bar rail as he fell. Tom, what have you done? This fellow's unconscious. Is there a doctor in the house? Yep, I'm a doctor. What's wrong with this man? Hey, let's see. <clears throat> bad, very bad. He has a compound fracture of the dorocolosis and his mangular romissus. Never is mind sa- all that. Will he live? Ain't got a chance. It's murder. Tom, now do you see what your fondness for the demon rum has brought you? Ah, what a bitter blow for my beloved when she learns her only brother is a murderer. She must not learn. The sheriff must be sent for. No, wait, squire. Wait. You gentlemen are mistaken. It was not Tom Beaumont who struck this stranger. You could not see because the light was out. It was I, Jack Bloodgood, who struck the fatal blow. Jack, that's a lie. Ah, be silent. Think of your sister. I, I alone am to blame. Ah, he falls into my trap. Beautiful. Ah, but I cannot let you suffer arrest, Jack Bloodgood, the son of my old friend. You must escape. My horse is outside, and here, here is some money. Over two hundred dollars. Ride quickly and leave the state, and then you will be safe. But Tom here, his father's money. I'll see to Thomas and to the money. I'll take your word, squire, and thank you. Don't thank me. It is a pleasure. And now, be gone. Tom, carry this message to Arabella. That I am hers alone through all eternity. And that I go now, not because I love her the less, but because I love honor more. Goodbye. (laughs) Now, where's the sheriff? Uh, Sheriff? Sheriff, did uh, I hear somebody call... uh... Oh, land of Goshen, there's been a murder. Let me out of here. No, you don't, Sheriff. Do your duty. Arrest that man. Oh, who do you mean? Who do you mean? Uh, the lad here, little Tommy Beaumont? Don't arrest me, Sheriff. There are four of us here who will swear that Beaumont struck this man. And once you've got young Beaumont in the calaboose, you can start out after another criminal. Another? And who do you mean? Jack Bloodgood. There's $5,000 missing from my bank. And Jack Bloodgood is the thief who stole it. When I accused him of it just now, he stole my horse and made for the state border. Well, crime and eve. Honest Jack Bloodgood, a bank robber and a horse thief. I'd never believe it. I want him arrested tonight and held in jail. Nobody's to see him or Tom Beaumont till after 12 o'clock tomorrow. Remember, not till after 12 o'clock tomorrow. <laughs> You can laugh, Squire Doolittle, and think you've won with your vile trickery. But if I know Jack Bloodgood, he'll give you your just desserts before he's through. Well, this is Conrad Nagel, ladies and gentlemen, ringing down the curtain on Act One of The Villain Still Pursues Her. <laughs> You know, as I stood here in the wings watching Robert Montgomery, I was reminded of the very different roles he's played, not only in pictures, but here in our Silver Theater. Throughout rehearsals also, I couldn't help but think what a very real actor he is and what a very real person, too. And I got to thinking how much that word real means to most of us, how much store we set by real persons and real things. Indeed, it's because we are so responsive to genuine possessions that even in many modest homes today you'll find the dinner table agleam with radiant sterling silver. Because sterling silver is genuine. It's solid silver, through and through. And in all the world, I think you'll find no more resplendent tribute to the rich loveliness of sterling silver than International Sterling's newest creation, Prelude. For Prelude's graceful lines and beautiful proportions are classically lovely. And its rose ornament carved with such patient artistry subtly interprets the new romantic mood of today. 
No matter what the decoration of your home, Prelude will gracefully take its place there. Correct and lovely always. Silver to gleam in beauty down the years. Solid silver by those most famous of silversmiths. International Sterling. Once again, it's curtain time. And we bring the second act of our melodrama to end all melodramas. The villain still pursues her. Starring Robert Montgomery as the very dashing hero, Honest Jack Bloodgood. With Helen Wood as the very shrinking heroine, Arabella Beaumont. It is the following day. Less than an hour, in fact, before the inevitable mortgage held by the arch-villain, Squire Doodle, falls due. And meanwhile, in the village jail... Blame not yourself, Jack Bloodgood. In truth, the fault is mine that my father and sister are about to be cast forth without a place to lay their weary heads while we are held here helpless, endurance vile. No, Tom Beaumont, I am not yet resigned. There is still time, despite this sudden and unseasonable snowstorm which sprang up unexpectedly during the night, for us to escape and remedy the damage we have done. But how can there be time? What time is it now? Wait, I shall consult my watch. Oh! <gasps> Oh, alas, you have dropped it. You think that matters? Listen to me, Tom Beaumont. This trusty timepiece was given me by my father on his deathbed. And though I have dropped it thus a score of times, yet never has it been wrong by so much as half a second. What time is it? Oh, 11 past 11. Less than an hour till noon. I tell you all is lost. No, son. For even now my dullard brain perceives its answer to our plight. There in your pocket. What is that you have? A bottle. A bottle of the demon rum, which last night brought us to this low state. Good. And now it's your rescuers. Where is our jailer? Sheriff! Sheriff! Eh? Who's calling the sheriff? Who is it? Uh, oh, oh, it's you. Now, it don't do you no good to beg me to let you out. And no use breaking out another, because I'll send the cavalry after you, if you do. There's a bunch of them in town we here. We didn't want to get out, Sheriff. Just wanted you to have a drink with us. No, sir. No, sir. Never mix with prisoners. I mean, the... the, the well, what was that you said? A drink, Sheriff. Will you share one with us? No, no, couldn't do that. Uh, well, maybe just a snort wouldn't hurt me none. <laughs> Where's the bottle? Uh, no tricks now by the heel peel jeepers. Come here into the cell with us and help yourself. My strategy is going to succeed, Tom. Pretend to drink with him. Just touch the bottle to your lips. This is once when rum shall prove a deliverer rather than a curse. <laughs> despair. There's yet time. And I know that nothing under heaven will prevent Jack Bloodgood from coming to our aid. You hope in vain, Arabella. There is none will come save Doolittle. <laughs> Father, you are ill. Oh, it is nothing. Pneumonia, perhaps, or worse. <laughs> Listen. There is Jack Bloodgood. He has brought the money. I shall let him in. Oh. Good morning. Squire Doolittle. Deacon Wilson. You know the deacon? I brought him along just for the ride. He comes in handy sometimes for marriages. Oh. And funerals. How do you do? Uh, how do you do? Uh, how do you do? Uh, uh, hello. You are aware that it is nearly 12? In case you weren't, I brought this clock. This. <laughs> you see, it has an alarm which will ring on the stroke of 12. But then, perhaps, you have the money? Alas, we have not. My son has been delayed. What a pity. Please, Squire Doolittle, can't you give my father time? Even a day. <laughs> I could give him forever to pay. That's up to you, my little buttercup. Here, come to my arms. No, no, a thousand times no. And I say yes. Here. Unhand me, villain. Nay, then, my proud beauty, you shall pay for this. And gladly. I would rather submit to the tortures of freezing and starvation than suffer the caresses of a villain that I hate. Though I have but one treasure, yet will I cherish it with all my strength and all my heart. <laughs> so be it. Look, then, at the clock. Six minutes to the fatal hour. <laughs> Father, 
Faster, faster, Jack Bloodgood. It is yet three miles to the farm, and there cannot be more than seven minutes remaining before the stroke of twelve. It is no use. Already the burden of us both has proved too much for this poor beast, and he is lame. It would be cruelty to ride him further. Whoa, Marcus Aurelius. But, Jack, it is vain to think we can arrive in time on foot through such a bitter storm as this. So be it, then. But still we may not ride the horse. Remember, son, better a man shall suffer endless torture to himself than be the cause of pain to a poor, dumb beast. <laughs> Come, we shall proceed on foot. Jack Budgood, listen. Footsteps approaching on horseback. It is the cavalry. The sheriff came to and fulfilled his threat. Quick, we must hide from them. No, we shall not hide. They who came as our pursuers shall be made into our allies. As sure as my name is Honest Jack, they shall escort us to your father's farm. And before the hour of twelve... You see, less than a minute until the farm is mine. Oh, please, Squire, have pity on us for sweet charity's sake. Ten seconds. Quick, my proud beauty. Change your mind while yet there is time. I can't. I can't marry you, Squire Doolittle. My heart belongs to Jack Bloodgood. But you could learn to love me. Two seconds. One second. Now. The farm is mine. Out, out of the house you go. But it is storming and there is snow and rain. To say nothing of hail and sleet. And my father is ill. He has a cold. <clears throat> My father is ill. He has a cold. Oh. Perhaps pneumonia? Uh, yes, I am ill. <laughs> you heard me. I said get out. Storm or no storm. Father, father, what can we do? We must go, my child. It does not matter. We shall cast out of our hearts all the happiness we have known here. How I brought your dear mother to this house as a bride. How you and Tom were born beneath this roof and grew to the full beauty of womanhood and manhood. How through the long years since your dear mother left us... Oh, stop! Stop! I can't do it, Father. I can't let my own happiness be the cause of tearing you from the home you love. I will marry you, Squire Do the Ah! Deacon, do your duty, the marriage ceremony, and quickly. Oh, yes, uh, uh, kiss the bride. Uh, no, I mean, uh, uh, join hands. Your hand, Arabella, my dear, that I may make it mine forevermore. Continue, Deacon. Dearly beloved, we are gathered together. Oh, yeah, forget the preliminaries, get to the point. Uh, do you, uh, uh, what's your first name, Squire? Ebenezer. Gesundheit. Oh, uh, Ebenezer. Oh, uh, do you, Ebenezer, take this woman, Arabella, to be your wedded wife, to love, and et cetera? I do. And uh, do you, Arabella, take this here, Ebenezer, to be your lawful wedded, et cetera? Answer, answer all. I do. Then, by the power vested in me as an officer of this state, I hereby pronounce... Stop! <laughs> The cavalry and Jack will be with them. Stop! You shall not escape me now. You let, can finish the ceremony. Let me. By go. the power vested in me, I hereby pronounce you. Unhand that woman! Jack! Jack! Not good! So you would foil me now, would you? Put down that gun, Squire. You won't take that. Silence here! <laughs> Silence! Who is the owner of this house? I am, Captain. I am the owner. Help me up. I, Ebenezer Doolittle, am its owner. Captain, by right of law, as this legal document will attest, on the stroke of twelve by yonder clock... But it's not yet twelve. My watch! Jack, alas, this time it is broken. Ah, yes, but not till it has done me one last service. Look at the time upon its face. A good ten seconds short of twelve. Captain, search the squire's pockets. Within them you will find both the money he stole from Tom Beaumont last night 
and the $5,000 which is missing from the bank. You shall not touch me. I am sure to you. So it is true. Take him away, Captain. And to those who will try him, please give this message. We to whom he showed no mercy ask that he be given mercy. Perhaps even now he has learned the error of his ways. Oh. Oh, that is so like you, Jack. Blood good. All right, Beetleface, come on. I go, but think not this is the end of this, Jack Bloodgood. I go to jail, yes, but the day shall come when I am released. And on that day, I shall have revenge. (laughs) Jack, oh, Jack, my hero. Arabella, my own true love. Tom, my son. Father, my father. I beg with all my heart your pardon, and I swear that never, no, never again, shall I take a drink of rum. Mm, he didn't say anything about whiskey. The deacon. Uh, I, I'm still here. Uh, somebody want me? As long as you're here, don't you think you should do your duty? Mm, oh, oh, sure, uh, of course. Uh, uh, join hands, please. Uh, uh, dearly beloved, uh, et cetera. Ah, uh, Arabella, this is our reward for an unselfish life, and down through a thousand tomorrows we shall walk hand in hand. Partners forever in that noblest adventure of all, the adventure that men call life. (laughs) In just a moment, ladies and gentlemen, Bob Montgomery will be back for a personal word with you. But first... (laughs) Now, there's a young man. <laughs> but first, there's a young man here who has some very special information. Don't miss hearing him. All right, John Carty. You know, ladies and gentlemen, there are many of you who are depriving yourselves of the joy and pride, the lasting satisfaction which genuine solid silver can bring you when you really don't have to. Because there are several practical ways for you to own solid silver, sterling silver, on even a limited budget. Take International Sterling's new and lovely Prelude creation, which we told you about a little while ago. You can buy a service of Prelude Sterling, complete for 8, 12, or 24 persons, just the way you buy your automobile or radio, out of income. Or you can build a service in Prelude Sterling by getting single place settings, one or two at a time, and adding others when and as convenient. A single place setting of six beautifully wrought pieces costs as little as $16.75. And those are only two of the easy, practical plans to help you own the very best in silverware. So I say to you sincerely, ladies and gentlemen, before you say, we can't afford sterling silver, visit your silverware dealer and get the facts. See him tomorrow, Monday, and discover for yourself that solid silver, international sterling silver, is easier than you thought to buy and more thrilling than you dreamed to own. And now back to Conrad Nagel. Thank you, John. Come on out here, Bob. <laughs> well, first of all, Bob, thanks for a lot of love. Oh, don't mention it, Conrad. I don't think anyone could have gotten a bigger kick out of it than we did. And right now, I want to thank Helen Wood for being a gracious leading lady, Henry Brandon for being a sinister villain, and the rest of the cast for their swell performances. That's all, and good night. (laughs) Good night, Robert Montgomery. We hope you'll be with us again soon. Ladies and gentlemen, Robert Montgomery is at present co-starring with Rosalind Russell in the MGM picture Fast and Loose. Helen Wood may soon be seen in RKO's Almost a Gentleman, in which she's co-starred with James Ellison. Next Sunday, Silver Theater will be on the air one hour earlier in all areas not changing to daylight saving time. Remember, if you do not have daylight saving time, Silver Theater will be heard at the usual hour. Our stars, Melvin Douglas and Constance Bennett, who will be heard in a thrilling love story of today. Be sure to listen. In the meantime, if you want solid silver, you want international sterling. If you want silver plate, you want 1847 Rogers Brothers, both proudly created by International Silver Company. The Villain Still Pursues Her was written for Silver Theater by True Borton. 
The music heard on this program was scored and conducted by Felix Mills. John Conti speaking. This is the Columbia Broadcasting System. <laughs>